Ready to go? Everybody hear me? All right. Uh, my name is Matt Janetta. This is Chris Lee. We work for Susquehanna, Susquehanna International Group, SIG. We're, um, we're basically a Wall Street firm right over on City Line Avenue. Um, uh, we're here. We got a booth next door. They're giving away coffee. So anybody wants some coffee, go grab it. Salah Kalum craft stuff. It's really good. Um, uh, go over and talk to them. Go over to the booth. Uh, you know, they're here to, to talk to you. They're here to, they want your resumes. You know, we're here to recruit. So, so go talk to those folks. Um, what we're here to talk about today is, is, is our adventure with Sysmon. Um, Chris and I work on the stock at Susquehanna International Group. We, um, we're the ones that are bringing in all the log data into our sim. We're um, writing, the, writing the rules in the sim, the fire alerts, and then we do those investigations. And if you go back in time, before we started using Sysmon, we were very much network focused. We were bringing in a lot of network perimeter logs. We were bringing in, uh, you know, firewall logs. We were bringing in IPS logs. We were bringing in web proxy logs. And uh, we were really good at finding malware uh, using those logs. Um, we could find command and control traffic really well, but then we would go to the host and try to figure out what was going on in the host. But we didn't have that host. Uh, we didn't have that host level forensics visibility. We didn't know what processes were running on the host, what was generating that, that network activity. Um, so that was our pain point. So around that time we decided, uh, you know, we wanted to try to solve that host endpoint visibility problem. Uh, and at that time we also knew that Sysmon was a tool that was catching a lot of, um, catching a lot of attention in the security field. We were starting to see conference talks on, on hey, there's this new tool called Sysmon that can detect attacks. We're starting to see bloggers and researchers posting, hey, there's this really new, uh, there's this uh, attack technique that we're seeing out in the wild. And, you know, I ran that attack in my lab, and I also stood up Sysmon in my lab, and Sysmon was able to detect that activity, and that was really cool. Um, so we knew that Sysmon, you know, potentially had, was viable to solve that problem for us, to give us that level of visibility. Um, but the problem is when, when, when we saw those conference talks and we saw those uh, bloggers writing about these, their research, they're really just standing things up in a lab. Nobody was really doing it at scale. We had to solve this problem uh, in an enterprise environment. We had to solve it over thousands of endpoints. We had to you know, create processes that were operationalized and we could do it all day long and do it efficiently. Um, and there wasn't a lot of research out there on that. So we, we kind of had to build that all up. And that's what this talks about. It's not just a Sysmon primer. Uh, that we'll get into that real quickly just to get you up to speed on the basics of Sysma. It's, it's really, how do you do it in an enterprise environment? How do you, how do you blue team with this stuff? So, um, so let's start with that Sysma primer. Um, uh, if, if you haven't come across Sysmon yet, it, it's, uh, it's a tool that's going to give you visibility, very rich, verbose, forensic level visibility and what's happening on a Windows endpoint. Uh, it's, it's, it's from the sysinternal suite of tools, so it's a free Windows utility. If you've done any Windows administration, you're most likely familiar with, with sysinternals. Um, it's going to install as a service on your, on your uh, workstation or server. It's going to run in the background, and it's just going to uh, watch what's going on and log lots and lots of data about what activity is happening on your endpoint, and it's going to log it to the Windows event viewer. Um, there's a lot of different things that Sysmon looks for. These are all the different event IDs. Um, the two that, we're, that we focused on the most was, was event ID number one, process created events. Process created events is every process that's spawning on a Windows system. It's going to give you very, very rich information about those processes. It's going to tell you the file that created that process, the process image. It's going to tell you the parent process. It's going to tell you the command line parameters that were, uh, that were sent when that process was created. And you get all that command line level detail. It's going to tell you what uh, the hashes of the files that created the process. Uh, another one is network connection events. It's going to tell you every network, network connection that that host made. It's going to tell you um, all the typical things that you'd expect from a network connection uh, protocol, ports, uh, source and destination ports, source and destination addresses. Uh, it's also going to uh, tell you the user and the process that, that generated that network traffic, which is particularly valuable. <laughs> Um, driver load information is going to tell you what drivers are loaded as well as the signature information for those drivers, what, uh, what are the file hashes for those drivers that were loaded. Uh, another one that's interesting is create remote thread, event ID number eight. Create remote thread is if you're injecting a thread into another process. 
So attackers might use this to uh, migrate to another process in order to get certain privileges or to hide their malware on your system. Um, sometimes if you're running Mimikatz on a system uh, and you, and you want to dump credentials out of LSAS, it's, uh, it's going to inject a remote thread into LSAS and you can detect uh, Mimikatz style attacks. And there's quite a few other things. I'm not going to go through each one, but there's quite a few other things. But what we found is that Sysmon's pretty actively being developed. Every couple of months, we see another version coming out. And the newer versions, the, the newer versions have these new event IDs. And these new event IDs that they bring out, the most recent ones were, I think, pipe events, um, 17 and 18. Uh, in the latest version, they also had um, uh, WMI events, 19 through 21. They're really tracking to what they're seeing in malware, what they're seeing in these attack tools that are being released. Um, uh, they're trying to they're trying to add in the features that will detect those types of tools. So they're really trying to track with with the uh, with the offensive uh, side as well. Um, cool. Oh yeah. So let's uh, let's real quick kind of take a run through here. Um, we'll just give you this rest of this primer. As Matt mentioned, we started with those process creation events and those network connection events. Uh, that was really our goal, right? We wanted to solve an internal network visibility, and we wanted to uh, solve that host-based uh, network connection uh, event data. So we started there, and we just picked those two out of there. I'm going to show you kind of the data that you're going to get in the details, and hopefully by seeing this, you'll understand why as we go through and we put this into our analysis piece. This is the rich data that we care about, and this is really going to be uh, beneficial to us down the uh, down the road. So when we fired this up and we started with those process creation events, um, this is all going to log, by the way. Uh, I don't think Matt mentioned this, but this logs locally to the Windows event log. Uh, so uh, anything that's in Event Viewer, that's how you're going to access this data uh, at, at, at the start of your uh, you know your adventure with this. So you'll go in here and you'll drop this down, and you'll see these event IDs. So when we generate a process creation event, this is that rich data that Matt was talking about, right? We're going to get timestamps on it. We're going to get the process quids. We're going to get all the associated information, right? We're going to get the image that ran, the actual application, along with the command line. So any of the parameters that ran with that, if it wasn't just launched like it is here, you would see all of that data. You'll get the rest of that information, right? You'll get the file hashes, what ran. You'll get SHAs, MD5s. And you'll get the associated parent processes as well, right? Which is really, really big for, uh, for us later on when we start talking about parent-child relationships when you're looking at malware and other malicious processes and going through that investigation. So this was real easy. You turn it on, and it just logs all those process creation events on the endpoint. To pair with that, again, for our goal for the networking side of this, was the network connection events. And when you start firing these on the host, you get a whole other subset of data that you can tie directly with this, right? If you'll notice at the top, we're looking at the same process squid, so we know that this network connection event stemmed from this instance of the application running. Uh, in this case, this is just a terminal services client on my desktop. But here, I can gather that this instance of terminal services, uh, terminal services tool is making an RDP connection to another host, right? And I get that data. I get the matching process squid, and I get the matching path. So I know that application ran uh, or made this network connection. Um, Hopefully, you're right there off the bat. You can kind of understand where that's already going to be beneficial to us. Um, when we did this, we started it. And uh, as Matt kind of mentioned, uh, we have about 6,000 endpoints that we need to do this on. Uh, so there's some other pieces to solve this that we'll get into as well. Beyond this point, uh, I just want to kind of touch on this, too. Uh, we'll get into where we started with it. So when you start, one of the things that you're probably saying is, Things like network connection events or things like process creation events, that can be noisy, right? That sounds really, really verbose. There's a lot of stuff happening on an endpoint. And when you're talking scaled at 6,000 endpoints, that's a lot of data. The nice thing with Sysmon is you have a fully functioning uh, set of filters that you can use via customizable XML. So when you go into this, you have the ability to include and exclude very detailed what you're looking for um, you know, based on your needs. For us uh, and for those of you, I highly recommend it. Uh, Swift on Security has a collaborative config that they put out there, and that's kind of what we used as our starting point. We realized that uh, you know there's some really good data in there, uh, and it was a great way for us to you know kind of dip our toes into the water and say, hey, uh, you know, how does this work? How can we really get the most out of it? So we started there, and they have a really great collab config. Uh, but for us, and uh, ultimately when we expanded this out um, to to other things beyond those two process events. Uh, we realized that we could cater this to our environment and squeeze even more out of it than that, that basic config that Swift has. So you'll see kind of some differences here where we've gone beyond what they were doing and we've dabbled in some of these other events 
uh, you know, for specific use cases with the hopes that we can detect some of these things with that additional data. So at this point, we kind of talked through the fact that this is happening on the endpoint since logging to the local Windows event log. One of the things that Sysmon doesn't do, though, is provide a means for transport, right? We're talking about wanting to use this in an enterprise environment, uh, you know, in our particular use case, a SIM or a log management tool. Having that data log locally on the endpoint is great, but you don't want to have to go and look at that, uh, you know, that data on the endpoint, as well as the fact that you're not going to get that, that alerting based on, uh, based on events if it's just on the local endpoint. So we needed a way to get that data back to our, um, you know, back to our SIM tool so that we can really take advantage of that analysis piece. Uh, for us, we found that, uh, you know, we could do it for free and, uh, and relatively easily with Windows Event Collection. Has anybody here used Windows Event Collection before? Okay, cool. A handful of people, right? Uh, if you're not using this or you haven't heard about it, definitely take a look. It's fantastic. It's native to Windows. It's agentless. Uh, anything server 2008 and up and Windows 7 and up, I believe, is running it. Uh, and really what this is doing is you can think of it as like a syslog for, for Windows, right? You're taking, uh, taking events and based on GPOs, telling those systems to send those events to another location. In our case, we're talking about a localized collection server. So we'll, you spin up a collection server, it's super easy. If you've ever gone in the Windows Event Viewer and noticed the subscriptions tab at the bottom that nobody ever uses, uh, that is a Windows Event Collection. So you spin that up, it starts a WinRM listener, and basically... Uh, you configure subscriptions, right, which are really just uh, subsets of event data that you want to collect. So you can go in there and you can say, give me all of your Sysmon logs, give me all of your, uh, you know, Windows application logs, Windows security logs, Windows system logs. It's not limited to just Sysmon. It's anything that's being logged to that Windows event viewer. You set that subscription up, you set up your list of hosts that you want. In our case, we just use domain computers. We say, anybody that checks into this thing, we're going to want you to push your logs to us. And that's it. The other side of it is on your endpoints. It's a simple GPO that gets applied. That GPO simply states via the, uh, the subscription forwarder, it says, hey, go to this server, check in, and see what subscriptions you have. And it'll do that. We push it to the endpoints. All of our endpoints will reach out, say, hey, what do I need to send you? We have that subscription configured to say we want to you know, take all this data in. And what will happen is from then on, we'll have a push of that data constantly from our endpoints to the centralized server. This is great even if you don't have a SIM tool. So even if you're, you know, you're a smaller shop and you don't have a SIM tool or a place that you can do, uh, you know, analytics with Splunk or Elk, uh, this is great to centralize that data because now you don't have to worry about going to each individual endpoint. You're getting it at least in one location that you can go through and you can filter and search for. At this point, really what we're doing is we now have that all in that centralized collection server. The next step is we just forward it from there into our SIM tool. And this is where we're really going to get that rich analytics, right? We're now taking this data. We have it in our SIM tool. In our particular use case, this is where we really found the benefit of, uh, of the SIM tool to be able to cater our Sysmon config. So we started with that basic config that we had, put it into our SIM, started grouping by, uh, you know, processes that were being created, network connections that were occurring, and tried to find all the noise and the things that we would expect to see and say, we don't care about any of that. Let's go ahead and filter it out. Or this is too noisy and it's not sustainable from an event rate perspective. Let's get rid of it. So we did all that, uh, you know, reapplied it to our Sysmon config and got to what, for our unique environment, was a custom-tailored, uh, you know, configuration. Yeah. Oh, I think, and when we, we approach our configuration, I think we really did approach, we want to get as much information as possible. And, and even though Sysmon generates a lot of information, like I said, it's very verbose, um, uh, it's, it's absolutely sustainable. It, it, you can handle it. Um, we didn't have, we didn't really butt up to a lot of problems where there was too much data. Uh, I think... You know, there were some processes that just created an absolute ton of events, and this is really valuable to help identify those, make a decision on whether that's something that fits in your use cases. Do you need to see this for any of your use cases? Do you need to see this for forensics review? Um, and if you don't, get rid of it because it can, can help you with some of the capacity issues. Um, but, but overall, and if you, if you think back to that, to the, if you go back to that Swift on security slide where we're comparing on what we did versus what Swift on security did, we always try to bring in more and more information. We've had a lot of success with that. We've been able to handle everything that we've uh, been able to throw on it with, with just a little bit of tuning. Yep, absolutely. Cool. All right, so we identified Sysmon as a solution. 
uh, figured out the configuration that we wanted to use, what was, what was our initial use cases with the process created event and the network connection events, uh, and, and expanded there as we had some success. Uh, we're transporting those logs with WEC to a centralized server, and then we're shipping those logs from that centralized server into our SIM. All right, so, so this is kind of how we did it at scale, the log collection, the visibility piece. This is how we did that at scale in our enterprise. Um, the other downside to Sysmon is all you're getting is the utility that's going to be logging that very rich forensics information. It's not going to do any of the, any of the analytics for you. Uh, you need to solve those problems on your own. Um, just to be able to search through that data, you need to get it into some sort of log management tool or SIM, Splunk, Elk, uh, or your SIM, you can start to analyze that data. That, that's one part of the, the problem to solve. Uh, another, another thing, other things that you need to solve as well, you're going to need to compare it to buying, going out and buying something, rather than bringing uh, uh, Sysmon in yourself and, uh, and trying to build it out yourself, you could go out and buy a commercial EDR tool. When you do that, you're going to have, you're going to have a, a vendor that's, uh, they're going to be giving you that user interface for you so that you can search through that log data. They're going to be creating security content for you and, uh, you know, rules and, and different analytics on top of the data to, to identify, hey, this is a specific, this is a suspicious process or this is anomalous. Um, you know, you're going to have all that with a vendor. If you're just using Sysmon as an open source tool, you've got to build all that yourself. Um, and, and that's what we did and that's what this next section of the presentation is to kind of show you some of the things that we built on top of this Sysmon foundation and uh, try to jumpstart you if this is something that you're interested in. Uh, try to jumpstart you and give, give you a couple tools and a couple starting points on how to do that. Uh, so the first thing we want to we want to talk about is um, sim rules. Uh, what are some of our most successful sim rules using the Sysmon data? What are some of our uh, our favorite things here? Um, so let's walk through a couple of the most successful ones. You want to kick off the first couple? Yeah, absolutely. So. Um this is probably one of our most fruitful and, and beneficial rules that we have, uh, our detection of Word doc macros via the Sysmon logs. So um, this is real straightforward and simple to set up. Uh, there's not a lot that goes into it other than spending some time tuning based off of what you're seeing in your environment. But basically what you'll do with whatever rule system you have in, in your sim is you're just going to look for those process creation events and we're going to do a, a parent-child relationship check again, right? We're going to say whenever the parent is winword.exe, and another process is spawned by that, right? So that event log is going to say, you know, malware.exe with parent process winword.exe. Um, fire, fire an offense, right? Fire an alert and let me know. Because, you know, beyond those normal cases that we would expect that we'll, you know, we'll get to talking about tuning, you don't want that, uh, you don't expect Word to be launching processes, right? That's very indicative of macros executing and running command line, PowerShell, uh, you know, and so on. So all you're going to do is look for that. And you can compare it against those process images. Uh, again, before you start, start firing actual alerts on this, uh, take some time to do some of that analysis. Look back at historical and say, hey, you know, now that this has been running for 30 days, uh, what kind of stuff is normal in an environment, right? Uh, things like Microsoft Help. So if you hit F1 when you're in Word, that fires the MS Help. Or Doc Watson if the, the process crashes. Those kinds of things are expected, you know, they're, they're normal behavior. That kind of stuff you can go ahead and tune out. Uh, and once you get this little real lean and mean, uh, it's fantastic for that because now anytime we see that kind of suspicious activity where words, uh, you know, executing a macro, we get, uh, we get an alert real fast and we can take a look at it. Yeah, this, this is probably our, this is our number one detection for detecting anybody clicking enable macros in a, in a mouse fan email. You still have users that are getting their systems compromised with, with ransomware. Um, you know, this, this is the one that catches it every time. We see this come in, we, we look at what's going on, we're reaching out to that user saying, hey, did you get an email and enable, uh, enable macros and, Yes. Yeah, and and kind of then to note that, right? We talked about Word, and that's the most fruitful. But um, any of the Office suite, or really any application that you can think of, where that application shouldn't be spawning other processes, you can write a rule like this to do that exact same thing, tune out that normal noise, and then you've really got yourself a nice rule to detect, you know, anomalous activity. By far, most of the commodity threats right now are using uh, Word doc macros uh, to get that foothold. Um, I imagine that if, if, if somebody's using some sort of exploit, this is going to also pick up. Uh, if somebody's uh, sort of trying to exploit some vulnerability in Word rather than just uh, using some sort of uh, 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 enable macros function, or uh, so. So really, this this one's really viable for any of your high risk client applications. Any time where users are are, are bringing files uh, off the internet and opening them up with one of those applications, whether it be Office Suite, Adobe Reader, 
any of your browsers. This rule, this kind of uh, framework of a rule works really well for all of those. Awesome. This next one, too, is probably uh, one of our top rules, especially uh, as of late. Uh, this is really great for you talk about living off the land and attacks that are now leveraging, you know, uh, applications that are built into Windows uh, is detection of suspicious PowerShell activity, right? So execution of PowerShell that's uh, anomalous. In this case, we're doing similar things, right? We're using that same event ID. So you talked about the value of Sysmon process created events. It's the same thing. Now we're looking at show me instances where PowerShell is launching. And then in that command line, we're seeing some sort of uh, anomalous or suspicious commands being run. In this case, right, maybe it's encoded command, which is not typical for legitimate processes, right? There's no reason to want to run that, uh, that command line encoded. Or hidden windows, uh, or using tools like invoke expression or downloading of files, right? Uh, things that, again, just most usage of PowerShell from an admin perspective aren't going to do these things. So tell me about it. You know, I, I know that, that that's there. I know that I can tune out the known good stuff. But then any, any other cases of that, tell me about it. Let me know. I'll, you know, I'll alert. Our analysts can go. We can have a look at it and see what's running here. And this has been the, you know, the same kind of thing. This, tied with the word macro uh, detections, you know, really complement each other nicely. As we've seen some of these attacks where, uh, you know, the macro executes and what's actually executing is a PowerShell command. And it's running invoke expression or it's running it encoded so we can't see what it was doing. So that's great from that detection piece, and they pair nicely together. Yeah. Um, so just a point of clarification about, about what's actually being logged here by Sysmon. Um, it's not, trans, uh, it's not uh, transcription logging on PowerShell. You're not getting every single PowerShell command that's running within a script. Um, or if somebody has an interactive PowerShell session open, you're not seeing every, every command that they type. What you're seeing is that initial launch of PowerShell. Uh, so it's really good when attackers are using PowerShell to try to get that initial foothold when they don't already have uh, access on a system. Um, they're going to they're gonna try to get some sort of PowerShell one-liner to run. Uh, it's not some script file that's already on the endpoint. It's some all-inclusive one-line PowerShell uh, command that they're trying to run to get that foothold. And that's what we're really trying to detect here. We're seeing a lot of those same malicious Word doc macro attacks, the commodity malware. When you click enable macros, typically the first thing that they do is run some sort of PowerShell command to download uh, some uh, uh, malware binary and then execute it on the system. This does a really nice job of detecting that. We also have had a lot of success with this um, uh, in, uh, in if you have an uh, if you have an active attacker in your network that's trying to move laterally from system to system. Um, they're going to typically, uh, if they're using PowerShell to get that initial foothold, you're going to trip this a lot of the time because they have to have everything kind of all-inclusive in that initial command. Uh, one more thing here. The, the, you're going to have some legitimate stuff in your environment. You have to tune. All these rules require some level of tuning, and it's going to be absolutely custom to your environment to figure it out. But um, uh, in this particular case, uh, you can look, we have a lot of stuff running that's just legitimate stuff that our technologists and our firm have built uh, that run with certain keywords. So we'll just tune out certain project names from the command line, and that'll help us get past uh, a, a lot of the legitimate stuff in our environment. Uh, so these are the two big wins from a uh, commodity malware point of view. This one's also, uh, and that initial foothold point of view, if, you're, if somebody's targeting you with a, with a mouse spam or a phishing uh, campaign, um, or active attackers moving laterally. These two are really good for that. These are probably our two most successful rule uh, templates. Um, we had a pen test recently, and, and, and we had our pen testers uh, try a number of different attacks uh, on us. And it, and it really got us thinking about how we could use the Sysmon data in, in creative ways. So, so these next couple of ones are, are a little bit more creative um, on how we could detect some of these attacks that, that were taking place. Um, first one we'll talk about is uh, rubber ducky and mouse jacking attacks. And they're, very similar attacks in that the attackers are trying to get their foothold by injecting keystrokes into a system. Uh, with a rubber ducky attack, uh, you're going to insert a USB drive in, uh, in an, into an unlocked system. And if, when you insert that USB drive, it's, uh, it's going to act like a keyboard interface and automatically start sending keystrokes to your system. The, effectively, what the keystrokes are doing is start, run, typing in a PowerShell command and hitting enter. And that's, that's the exploitation. On a mouse jacking attack, the concept's very similar. Um, but what I'm going to try to do is, is uh, hijack uh, the connection between a wireless mouse and its receiver. And if I, can if, I can, if I can inject into that, then I can inject keystrokes. 
and um, and then the attack follows the same general. Uh, then the, the attack's generally the same. I'm going to send keystrokes to go start, run, PowerShell, and run my command, and get my initial foothold. So we thought, how could we detect this with PowerShell, uh, with uh, Sysmon uh, logs? And what we said is, let's look for process-created events where the parent process is Explorer, right? Because by going start, run, and typing in your command, you're doing that within the Explorer shell. So the parent process is going to be explored. And then the process image file name is PowerShell.exe. So this one's going to require a little bit of tuning uh, because you're absolutely going to have stuff that runs PowerShell from Explorer. The first one to get rid of is um, uh, tune out anything where there's a reference to a .ps1 file, uh, where they're potentially double-clicking double a script. Um, the attacker, when they're trying to do this, they're not going to be leveraging a, a PS1 file that's already on disk because they're trying to get that initial foothold. So you won't be tuning out that attack. The second thing is, well, if I'm an explorer and I double-click PowerShell, that's also going to fire this rule as well. So you have to tune out if just somebody's just trying to open up PowerShell. Uh, and then you might have some other things in your environment that, that might trip this, but the first two, once you've got those tuned out, it's much less, much, uh, the tuning should be a lot easier. Sticky key attacks. Um, so the concept here is uh, if, if I, uh, if I want to get persistence on a system, um, if you're if you're not familiar with the attack, if you if you uh, hit shift five times, it'll run an accessibility executable um, uh, that'll pop up on the screen. That's just calling set hc.exe. That will even work. Um, so what what the attack is is you swap out set hc.exe with a piece of malware or even just cmd uh, command.exe or cmd.exe, if you hit shift five times, it'll pop up the shell. That works even at the Windows login screen. So that potentially gives you the ability to get access to a system um, uh, without logging in. So we could set up a rule to do something very similar. Look for execution of setHC.exe, but look through your logs, find all the legitimate hashes for setHC.exe that exist in your environment. You'll get that when people, you know, when people trip that, uh, that'll generate the logs, and you can just look for all the legitimate ones, validate that there really are setHC.exe, put them all into a list, then you can write your rule to say, if I see setHC.exe execute, and it's not one of these known good file hashes in my environment, fire an alert. So I think it's just worth stating off that too, right? That's mostly stemming from a physical access to a device, right? Or, or an un unencrypted drive, right? Removal of the actual physical device, placing it into another drive, uh, placing it into an enclosure, and then from another machine, dropping a replacement of whatever executable, right? CMD.exe or the, the help.exe, so that when you pop it back into the, uh, into the actual chassis and you fire that thing up, you're going to run that by executing sticky keys. So there is a little bit of that from, from a physical access standpoint. All right, I'm going to pick it up here because we're we got a demo that we want to get to. So uh, some lateral movement attacks. We've had some some success detecting lateral movement. Um, uh, very similar process created event. If you see the parent process is WMI PRVSE.exe uh, and it's launching command.exe or PowerShell.exe, that's that's going to be suspicious. That could indicate somebody moving laterally from system to system using WMI to execute uh, to execute a process on the system. Um, we, when we wrote this rule up, we didn't see a whole lot of legitimate stuff that was doing this. So this is one that doesn't require a lot of tuning, but can detect lateral movement with WMI. Um, you can do the same thing with PSExec. If some, if, if, if an attacker or, or somebody's using PSExec to move laterally within a system, you can just look for um, process execution for PSExec at uh, SBC.exe. Um, I wouldn't ex expect an attacker to be running just PS exec straight up without trying to hide it or manipulate it in some way. Uh, if you want to try to detect somebody being sneaky with it, you can get creative. If, if, if they're using one of the legitimate PS exec uh, executables, maybe they're just renaming it. Um, you can create a uh, you can create another list of known hashes for PS exec.exe and similar, and then look for any time one of those hashes execute, but they have a different name. That could indicate that somebody's trying to uh, use PSExec on the sly. Um, bonus, if you if you can get your SIM, you can write a rule. If you're using a SIM, you can write a rule that auto-populates a list of known hashes for PSExec that you see in your environment, and this rule kind of tunes itself. 
Um, I mentioned this one earlier, but uh, you can potentially detect Mimikatz attack or, or memory. Uh, you can detect uh, somebody dumping credentials from memory by monitoring for create remote thread to your LSAS.exe or win login processes. Um, there's, there's not a lot of things that do this, um, but regardless, it's very easy to tune. Just turn it on, take a look at what's injecting into one of those two processes, um, tune out the things that, that, that you can see that are legitimate, and then just look for anything new that's injecting into those processes. All right. Those are, those are the SIM rules. So when those SIM rules fire, we have to do an investigation. Um, we think that we think that this investigative process is one of the most important processes in our SOC. The better, the more effective that we can do our investigations, the more and more alerts that we can look at, the more efficient that we are. We're doing something uh, that we think is a little different. Um, we're using a combination of PowerShell and Excel to do these analysis of these sysmon logs. So we basically have four pieces of PowerShell that run. Uh, the first one, the way that we run it is we give it an alert ID out of our SIM. So we say get uh, get process search. What it's going to do is uh, PowerShell is going to reach out to our SIM, pull down the SIM alert. It's going to find the subject of the alert, and it's going to find the time parameter. When did this alert occur? When did it start? When did it stop? Um, then it's going to craft a query and send it to the SIM to say, give me all the logs, give me all the Sysmon logs for that host on that given time frame. And add 15 minutes before and 15 minutes after so we can get some context before and after the alert fired. It's going to pull those logs back into PowerShell programmatically. Next thing that we're going to do is we're going to analyze those logs and we're going to enrich the logs with tags that we think are interesting. The first one that we're going to focus on is um, identifying the suspect, which process triggered the alarm. We can get that from the SIM uh, in the alert. And then what are the, who are the parents and who are the children processes from that suspect? So we look at that parent process and, and process um, uh, uh, relationship in each one of those Sysmon process created logs created logs, and we identify the, ch the parents and the children, and we add a tag in that PowerShell object for that. The third, uh, and the other thing that we do is we, other, we look for things that otherwise look suspicious. Is this process running out of the app data directory? Is this process an admin tool like cmd.exe or powershell.exe? Uh, is it running from a scheduled task? Things that m an attacker might use that are relatively uh, unusual on a system. And what we're doing is, uh, so, so we're adding that tag here. The third thing that we're going to do is we're going to export these programmatically to Excel. And this isn't creating a CSV file. We want all that rich formatting that you'll get with an Excel file. So we're going to programmatically um, interact with Excel using com objects in PowerShell. We're going to open the, an instance of the application. We're going to hide the window. We're going to paste in our log data. We're going to format it as a table with, with colorful formatting. Uh, we're going to organize our columns. We're going to sort the data. We're going to highlight anything that has a tag, right? If we tagged it as a suspect, it's going to be in red. That's going to be our starting point. If it's a parent or a child, it's going to be in orange to see that relationship. And if it's just something suspicious, it's going to be yellow. So we paste that into Excel, format it as such, and save it off to disk. We've actually got this to a point where you know, the analyst would typically run out process search, give it an offense ID, and all this runs and collects all the information in about 30 to 60 seconds. We've got this scripted out so that when the alert fires, these things run in the background. So when the analyst is ready, the data is already there. They're just popping open an Excel file that's already been created and formatted for them. Um, all the information is in the Excel file. Most interesting stuff uh, brought to the forefront, and so the analyst can focus in on the most important things. So you got a demo for this? Yeah, absolutely. Let's see if I can do this one-handed with a mic in the other. So let's go through this, right? We've talked about this a couple times now. Uh, it's our favorite just because it's so easy and it's, uh, it's something that everyone can uh, you know, relate to. Uh, at this point, we're going to assume uh, that somebody's received your typical mouse spam like this. If you haven't seen this, you're probably compromised. Uh, but we're going to assume that this user has opened this up and said, yeah, I'm going to enable editing, sure. From our analyst side, we're going to see that initial sim alert fire. We're going to see that a couple rules were matched here. Uh, our top two favorite that we talked about earlier, our suspicious process by word, and our suspicious PowerShell uh, command uh, parameters fires. Rather than having to go through this interface and view the data here, we have that tooling that we've now used with that custom PowerShell, or I'm sorry, custom Excel document. So as an analyst, our team, we just go over to this pane. We run in PowerShell just this one liner to, to feed that document out to us. And we're going to get. 
It's going to be hard because this isn't mirrored up here. Yeah, apologies. We're, <clears throat> we're going to get this nice large spreadsheet of data. And again, what we're seeing here is that, that time frame based off that offense that fired. So the SIM pulled right the, the suspect event, and we have that timestamp. This is going to then gather all of the events that we have from the 15 minutes before and 15 minutes after if it exists, right? If this is happening at a, at a time where we're not getting to it right away, we'll also have that, that subsequent 15 minute window as well. Um, we can also run this at any time with a manual larger window uh, should we need to. But ideally, we're going to pop in here as an analyst and I'm going to see this whole wall of data. Now, typically for us, because we use this every day, we know what we're looking for, we know how we can go through this and we can systematically find what we want. For the sake of the demo, because, uh, because we're kind of limited in screen real estate, uh, we're going to shrink this down here. And uh, I'm going to take out anything that we didn't tag from this event. And what I end up with is a much smaller subset of data, right? Uh, we have tags in yellow, tags in orange, tags in red. And those are going to be broken down by why they were tagged, right? Whether they're these suspicious things like scheduled tasks that, that we said we want to know about and we want to highlight when that happens. We see things like admin tools running and we see the relationships, the, the parent, grandparent, uh, I'm sorry, parent, child, grandparents. And then we see admin tools as well. So we did all of that, uh, you know, automatically and we now have this subset of data that we can look at. When we look at this here, you're going to notice that highlighted red, right? That's the suspect. That's the thing that matched our SIM rule that said, if you see words spawning another process, tell me. And what you're really getting from this data standpoint is a look at, this is difficult on the screen, enhance. I don't know if we can enhance anymore. I'm actually going to bring this over. So we'll have, this, we'll have this list, right? And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to look at that highlighted red where I can see that the process that ran was cmd.exe, and I don't see because it's off the screen here, uh, the associated parent process column saying that Word ran this. But if I actually go in, and again, we got the, all those pro, uh, command line parameters, right? That's all captured in the sysmon data. I can see up top here in that, that white pane the fact that command run, uh, right, and it calls PowerShell, and we see some calls here for some functions. We're going to create some new objects. We see an executable uh, named. We see the pulling of two PNG files from uh, a couple of domains. Uh, and then we see some, uh, you know, some subsequent stuff to, to write that out. And we'll launch a batch script from a temp folder uh, as well. So some pretty nasty stuff here. Obviously, we know that this is, uh, you know, is malicious. But we get all that data here. And we kind of know what we're looking for. As we go down this chain now, what I can do is see exactly that, right? So the next line below it is going to be that instance of PowerShell running with cmd.exe as the parent. Uh, and again, in that case, the command lines are the same. It's just the fact that PowerShell called cmd and then fed it that line. But we'll go down further again, and we'll start to see that subsequent activity occur, right? We'll see the fact that cmd generates this command line to run this batch file out of that temp folder. So now we know that that batch file ran as well as immediately following another temp file, that executable that we saw. So all of these things that we saw tied to that original mal, uh, mal spam uh, email that launched, we see all this, and we have that data here. We'll go down subsequently again and see that that executable is called, and we have a child process to that executable that gets dropped in, uh, in an app data folder called buttrz. And buttrz here runs, and that's obviously interesting and of concern. But then, as an analyst, I'm going to take note here a little bit further down that I can see highlighted in yellow the fact that uh, we tagged Task Engine now running that same executable every three minutes. So from a persistence perspective, we had the original parent-child relationship to say that we saw that executable running. But where that would have fallen off initially, uh, and we would lo lose that visibility, the fact that we care about looking at things like scheduled tasks and other admin tools, we now have this nice pretty picture of every three minutes on the dot, <laughs> that executable running again. Anything you want to highlight there? I don't know if you want to talk about some of the other data in here. I know it's hard to No, so the, I mean, just to recap, right, so, so we started with that cmd.exe running that PowerShell command. We see that rich full command line of the PowerShell command that runs. Because this is that initial exploit attempt, it's got to have all the information in there. So we see that they're trying to download a file. They're executing a file. Uh, they're executing a, a batch job. And then because of the parent-child relationships, we can see 
um, we can follow that chain down the process stack to, to, to see what's launching what um, all the way down. So. so that's a good point too. Let's let's talk about following the chain the other way real quick, right? We knew that this is what fired our sim rule because that's what we were looking for. But maybe now as an analyst, I want to try and determine, well, what file was opened in Word that I actually care about, right? I now want to be able to go back to whoever that user was and say, hey, you know, do you recall this email with this file, yada, yada, yada. I can go back up with those grandparent relationships. So now, immediately following it, I see Word spawning. And the command line for Word, I'm going to get this nice little convenient set here where in temporary internet files for Outlook attachments, I see something called secure message dot doc, right? So now I have the name of the file that ran because I have that, that actual command line that ran when Outlook opened WinWord, and I can see the file name. Obviously at that point too, you're also getting the fact that this came from an Outlook email, right? Outlook was the parent process for this. We know this came from an email, not from an internal location. So, so we have the whole picture at this point, right? We know um, you know, we, we, we were alerted because we saw some weird PowerShell running. Um, but we can now go back to the user and say, hey, we saw that you were in Outlook and you opened up Word. You know, we usually see that these are malicious Word doc macros. Did you, did you open a, did you get a suspicious email? Can you send that to us? Can we go and then use that information to search our logs to see if anybody else received the same email? Uh, we know that the system was successfully compromised. We can see that the download was successful. Our proxy didn't block it. Um, there were additional processes that were spawning after that. So we do know that they did get their hooks in this. If we didn't see, um, those processes spawning, we might be able to say, you know what, we saw that command run, but they didn't successfully download the file, and we're confident that the system's not really uh, compromised. We don't need to pull it. We don't need to re-image it. We don't need to disrupt the user. This is the value that we get now with host visibility that we didn't get with network uh, visibility um, that I mentioned earlier, where you can see, you know, the, the malicious downloads or the CNC traffic. Now we actually know how compromised is the system. Right, and it's, it's worth noting again, too, this was all done with just that single event ID from Sysmon, right, the process created events. This wasn't using anything else here. So just by turning that on, uh, you know, on your endpoints, you're getting some really rich data that you can really use. Um, you know, the network connection piece and that visibility and some of the other stuff uh, we don't have in this tooling and, and we didn't have to show you, uh, but, but you can just imagine we're adding that on and bolting it on enhances all of this. Can you get me set back up here? Yeah. Yeah, 95% of the value that we get out of Sysmon is a process created event. Um, the network connection event really helped us solve the internal network visibility problem. When we have a compromised system, answering the question, did that system talk to anybody else? You know, um, to try to detect lateral movement once we have a compromised system. But, but most of the value that we get from process created events. Um, we're getting a little tight on time, but we're, we're getting close to the end here. Um, so just, I wanted to give some, some jump starts here that if you wanted to, um, try to build something similar. The first thing you need to do is get those logs. It wouldn't make sense for us to give you the, how we get the logs from our sim because it's custom configured, but you can get them straight out of the Windows Event Viewer with this one-liner in PowerShell. It's built in win, uh, get win event. Give it the parameters. It'll pull all the sysmon logs uh, from that local system. And you can run, run this remotely over the network to remote computers as well. So if you have sysmon configured and just logging locally and you're not even centralizing it, you can still pull those logs over remotely and start to do some of that analysis. The problem is that that's going to give you data that's just raw payload information. It's not very PowerShell-y. It's not going to have everything parsed out so that it's easy to work with and paste into Excel. Here's a function. Uh, um, if, you, if you guys are interested in the slide deck, we're going to try to get approval to get this uh, uh, sent out. So um, if, grab a card from us, or we'll have our email addresses up at the end. Talk to us. We'll get you this deck if we can. Um, but this is a function that takes that raw payload and um, extracts out the key value pairs and adds them as properties in PowerShell um, so that you can work with them as objects. This is just a cheat sheet um, of how we interface with Excel programmatically with PowerShell. Again, it's all built in. You don't need to download any additional libraries or anything to do this. Um, uh, it's how you open up an instance of Excel programmatically. It's how you hide the window, minimize the window. It's how you uh, uh, format things as tables. It's how you do uh, conditional formatting, um, saving it off, closing it up, cleaning up after yourself. This is a cheat sheet to get you started. Um, this is all available on the internet. You know, it's just hard to, to root through and figure out how to start, but this is a good cheat sheet for like a getting started. Um, another thing that I would recommend is if you're, if you're gonna try to code 
uh, to interact with Excel programmatically. Take advantage of, if you've ever seen the record macros function within Excel, um, if you're trying to figure out what functions will do certain things, you can use that record, uh, record macros. Do the changes that you want to do programmatic manually in the user interface, then stop recording. It's going to give you the code that it used, that it would use to make those changes. You can use that to kind of get a hint on what functions that you need to focus in on. Um, wrapping up, we, we're, we're trying to do some more advanced analytics with this. Everything that we've talked about today is very much getting the logs, re, uh, firing alerts, reviewing the logs, but we're not looking at things from an, enter, uh, from an environment point of view. We're not relating to our environment to understand what's normal in our environment. Um, this is an effort to do that. It's called SCORE. It's a custom MS SQL backend database that we, uh, that we uh, created that it, it nightly we query all the processes that ran in our environment on every endpoint. We summarize this data pretty granularly, but we summarize it so it's like this process ran with this parent process by this user on this workstation 10 times between this time and that time. And we stuff all that into a database. And what we have at the end of the day is the ability to say, hey, I see this hash in my environment. How many other systems in my environment have run this hash? And I'm, you know, if I'm doing an investigation, I come across a suspicious hash, and I ask that question, and I say, well, only this system's been running it. I'm going to have a much different um, concern than if 2,000 systems in my environment are running, and that probably tells me this is legitimate, or it's in my base image, or we're really owned, and we have major problems. Um, the second, so that's prevalence. That's this concept of prevalence that, that this solves for us that we don't otherwise get. Um, the other one is we take those logs, we, we ultimately have a list of hashes that are run in our environment, that we've seen in our environment. We have a nightly job that just checks those against virus total and pulls back the results and say, you know what, if I have processes in my environment, um, you know, I can run those across 60 antivirus engines using virus total if they've seen that hash before, and they can highlight, you know, we can run queries to highlight things that are, uh, um, that are known bad by virus total. Cool. So, um, to get started, you know, just to recap a lot of things that we talked about, if this is something that you want to do in your environment, highly recommend just start playing around with Syspon if you haven't. Just install it. You'll get an immediate forensics benefit right off the bat. Um, even just start with the create remote, create uh, the process created events. Uh, again, we get 95 plus percent of the value from those. Once you get that deployed out, then you can start to look at centralizing it to one place. That'll give you a longer term forensic store. It'll give you the ability to hunt or run your scripts from one place so you can look for. Um, you can have scripts to look for certain malicious activity uh, all in one place. Get it integrated into your sim. That's really going to enable you to do the analytical piece and tune things uh, much more effectively. Um, and uh, get, if you can get into your sim, you can start doing that real-time detection as well. Um, I highly re recommend, too, the, the thing that you're not going to get with Sysmon or probably even your sim is a really good way to... Um, to do those investigations, to see those relationships, to highlight things that are suspicious. Consider using uh, PowerShell and Excel to do that. Anything else? That's it. All right, that's what we have, so thank you very much. Thank you. Careful. Yeah. Hang on a second. Um, with Sysmon, are you able to uh, detect like file less memory uh, memory based PowerShell attacks that may or may not generate any events or event IDs? If it's if it's spawning a, it depends when you say file is. So if it's if it's writing to the registry, it does have registry. Or they, they just open up a Windows command and then just make a .dot .NET API call to Windows API. And that may not generate an event for you. Um, Would you be able to it detect? It, 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 it is very process. Um, it is very process focused. So if, if the result is that it's creating a process, yes, you'll be able to see it. If you're injecting into memory and bypassing the need to um, create a process, you might detect it with process access events or threat injection uh, events, uh, create remote thread. But the key is, yeah, create, if it creates a process. So it depends on how that attack works. Right, so can you detect the, um, the Windows command, the PowerShell sort of Windows command, when they run the script? Would you be able to detect that with Sysmon? 
Like they they run the PowerShell through a Windows command script. Are you able if to detect? If it spawns the PowerShell process, which it would, it would need to do, you would see that. Okay, but nothing afterwards, right? Right. Once once PowerShell is open, and if you have an interactive session, you're not going to get anything more than that. Okay. Right. Thank you. If anybody, if anybody else has any questions, feel free to come up. Uh, we'll be here. We'll also be at the Susquehanna booth, the SIG booth uh, next door if anybody wants to chat.